Back in 2016, whilst collecting samples of plastic sludge from outside a bottling facility in Osaka, Japan, scientists discovered a bacteria surviving off of a plastic diet. Plastic we know is a problem, 300 million tonnes of it is created and thrown away each year. The UN reported in 2019 that only 15% of all plastics worldwide are collected for recycling. The rest of it ends up in landfills or worse, in our environment, our waterways, rivers or the sea. Our natural world is great at breaking down waste, but plastic has evolved so fast that nature hasn't really been able to keep up. Microbes are some of nature's best recyclers, but are they capable of solving our plastic problem? Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles and in today's video we're going to be diving into the plastic rubbish that plagues our planet and exploring how scientists and enterprises are developing new ways to tackle plastic. I also want to talk to the subplot of what actually happens to make an exciting discovery and try and move it out into the world, the problems that are naturally encountered and how scientific, engineering and commercial teams try to solve them. Plastics are usually recycled mechanically. They are sorted, cleaned, shredded, melted, and remolded. Each time plastic is recycled this way, its quality is degraded. They can be used to manufacture new bottles and containers, packaging, strapping, and other applications such as carpet and apparel, but the number of times that it can be used this way is limited. Back to that team in Japan. The bacteria scientists discovered surviving off of a plastic diet was Idionella sakaiensis, and it was chewing on a plastic called polyethylene terephthalate or PET, P-E-T for short. PET is a plastic that's widely used to manufacture plastic bottles, virtually all single serving two litre bottles of carbonated drinks and water, things like that in the US are made from PET. From a paper I found about 73 million metric tons of PET were produced worldwide in 2020 alone, of which about a third was for food and liquid containers and two thirds were for synthetic fibers for clothing, furniture, fabric, those sorts of things. The bit that blows my mind is that currently the only PET products being recycled are bottles and only 37% of those bottles actually ever get recycled. So that's about 4% of the entire production volume each year of PET. Idionella sakaiensis was found capable of decomposing PET by producing two enzymes that hydrolyze the plastic polymer. Hydrolyzing or hydrolysis is a type of chemical reaction in which a bond is broken by insertion of water molecules. These bacteria possess two key enzymes, PET-As, PET-As and MHET-As, which are able to digest PET plastic polymers in particular. Of these, PET-As breaks down plastic into smaller parts, primarily MHET, then MHET-As splits these into two basic building blocks of PET, terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. The idea here is that you have the constituent parts of PET, the monomers, so that you can recombine them at some point in the future to make further PET products. In theory, you can do this infinitely. You don't ultimately hit a limit on the recyclability, so you can get something much closer to a circular economy for those materials. That's the theory at least. But theories are well and good, let's talk about the practicality. How well does it actually work? Is it actually a solution? A 2016 paper from the Kyoto Institute of Technology reports that the wild type bacterium, the type that naturally occurs in nature, can break down about a 0.2 millimeter thickness of PET film. That's about the thickness of human hair. And that PET needs to be of the type that is the low crystallinity, the soft sort of PET and it takes it about six weeks to break down. In theory, it could also break down, it could degrade the high crystallinity PET, but it would be approximately 30 times slower, which would take about 180 weeks or about three years to do. Now this might leave you feeling deflated, but keep in mind as a good rule of thumb, discoveries are very rarely immediately practicable. Very rarely are they plug and play kind of solutions. If there was a wild type bacterium out there that was incredibly efficient at PET disposal, we probably would have noticed already because our plastic waste would be being dissolved before our eyes uh, and it wouldn't be an issue, so we wouldn't need to worry. But given that isn't the case, what is the route forward? A large amount of manufactured PET is this high crystalline, the hard type, so any prospective applications of this bacteria will need to be preceded by some amount of genetic or otherwise optimization of the enzyme. The strategies that you can take are either waiting for evolution to do its thing, which is kind of a slow process usually, or you can try and induce functional changes in the enzyme that optimize their performance. So, 
All that to say, whilst the discovery of this Idionella bacteria was an exciting one, in terms of its ability to break down plastic waste natively, it was probably going to be pretty limited. But with the benefit of time travel, let's fast forward four years and jump over to France, where back in September in 2021, Carbios, a French startup company, performed a demonstration in which two metric tons of PET was broken down into its monomers in a matter of hours. Carbios used a similar enzymatic process to decompose the plastic that the bacteria does, but with a significantly optimized enzyme. They used a reactor vessel of about 20 cubic meters to decompose the PET in 10 to 16 hours, which is the equivalent of about 7,500 ground up plastic bottles per hour, which seems like reasonable going. Carbios have been working on an enzymatic recycling system since 2011, when the company was first founded. This year, they've partnered with PepsiCo and Nestle and a few other brands who are committed to integrating plastic recycling into product manufacturing. On May 10th, 2021, Carbios also successfully completed a post-IPO equity raise to secure 140 million euros. Building off of the creation of the demonstrator reactor that they did back in September, the company plans to scale up to the industrial plant that will house a reactor 20 times as large as the Demo-1 by about 2025. Reading through some of the disclosure information that Carbios makes available to investors, they are looking ultimately to make a licensing and a recurring enzyme sales play beyond the larger scale-up facility which they're launching in 2025. This makes a lot of sense because it allows them to integrate with other recycling houses rather than just trying to compete against them. A further bit of good news is that estimates from researchers in a recent report suggest that PET manufactured from its monomers created by an enzymatic decomposition reduces greenhouse emissions by between 17 to 43 percent compared to making virgin PET from new resources, which is a pretty good reduction. However, as with all things, this isn't a perfect solution. There is an economic challenge remaining. Carbios product is around double the price of virgin PET, that is PET made from just the raw materials. And conventional mechanically recycled PET is about 50% more expensive than virgin PET. So ultimately the Carbios approach is the most expensive way of solving this problem, but still in comparison, the average cost of a small bottle would be about two cents, which is a relatively small expense, I guess most people would argue for manufacturers, but it's still doubling the existing prices. And I guess troublingly, this leaves the onus on manufacturers or maybe lawmakers to choose to put the environment before profit, which we can't necessarily is always a guarantee. Having said that, L'Oreal set up a consortium with Carbios, which Nestle Waters, PepsiCo, Suntory Beverages, uh, food and beverage company have also since joined. In 2019, L'Oreal also invested in Carbios via its venture capital fund, Bold, so actually in terms of commercial strategy, Carbios seem to be doing all of the right things. They're partnering with groups which should hopefully integrate them ultimately into their sales and product lines. But the question remains, I guess, how do you target other manufacturers that maybe have slimmer margins and maybe aren't so motivated to try and do something so environmentally friendly? Saving the world, it turns out, often also needs to save people money, or at least not cost them extra. I think that's always disappointing, but I guess kind of to be expected set of constraints that you have to operate in. So here are some of the options that they have available to them. They could continue to refine the process or scale it up to the point where you get improved economies of scale to reduce the overall costs. This might or might not be possible depending on how the process works. It depends on a lot of factors. They could try and target the building of brands that emphasize recyclability of their products or packaging and rely on consumer adoption to apply some competitive pressure, ultimately pushing out those people that don't choose to use environmentally friendly products in their manufacture uh, out of the market. Or I guess what may be most practical and maybe even kind of the role of government or lawmakers if they want to help, uh, they have three kind of levers that they can pull on. They could offer subsidies, which partly cover the running costs of these 100% recyclable processes or products. They could maybe introduce some sorts of taxation to tax the sale of virgin PET products. So the price point becomes at least level with these 100% recyclable versions. Or maybe more extremely, they could introduce bans to eliminate the use of single-use plastics, which they have done in a, a few countries and a few sorts of product sets. 
Now, this sort of leveling of the playing field absolutely could feel unfair or a little bit controversial. I'd like to know what you think, but there is already a negative burden associated with making new plastics. It's got limited recyclability. So ultimately, after maybe a few versions of recycling, it will end up in the landfill or in the environment. Maybe increasing the financial cost to reflect this sort of environmental burden is actually really important to drive the right kind of human behaviors. Until that point, there is a bright future out there, but we just need to make sure we aren't on the darkest timeline. What do you think? Let me know down below in the comments section. Until that time, thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye.